Last year, the entire OTC FX industry faced a lot of challenges with regard to prime brokerage and obtaining liquidity from the Tier 1 banks. We take a look at what's going to happen in 2017. Nowadays, especially last year, how a brokerage is structured, not just a brokerage, but the entire components of the retail trading system has come to light through what I would consider to be a giant magnifying glass that has been brought about by, from both ends of the system, from the tier one banks, which are really been restricting counterparty credit to OTC derivatives companies, to prime brokerages and their respective customers, and from the retail brokerage and retail client end, who understand this full well nowadays. It's not the same as it was when a retail brokerage didn't understand about prime brokerage and just took a liquidity feed and let them get on with it. It's so, so transparent nowadays that there are two problems. Lack of, uh, lack of ability to get a prime brokerage without a massive balance sheet and full understanding from the retail side. So this is, this is something which is going to happen even more this year probably. Oh, I agree. Uh, I mean, uh, over the past five years, uh, there's been a, well, there's been a, a drive to more transparency, uh, as well as, uh, uh, and also we've had a lot of incidents in the industry, such as the SMB event. Yes. Uh, you have flash crashes. You have, uh, right. you know, political, uh, you know, instability and and monetary policy divergence. So uh, there's a lot of, you know, volatile moments uh, in the in the in the FX market, well, in the whole financial industry, and. Uh, so this has caused, uh, you know, some of the, the larger tier one prime brokers uh, pull back a little bit because of uh, worry of credit risk with who they do business with. And uh, so uh, a lot of the big banks have, have uh, increased their thresholds for many retail brokers to enter, you know, to get a relationship with them. So this opened up a space with, uh, you know, uh, more or less a, a second or third tier prime brokers uh, uh, entering the space to fill the gap uh, needed. Um, we, we as Swissquote, we actually uh, created a prime of prime service, which, which basically helps uh, fill this gap and, and, uh, and where we're uh, offering uh, pr uh, prime, in a way, prime brokerage through to our uh, retail brokers uh, and uh, providing them access to credit uh, and excellent liquidity. Uh, plus providing the whole technology and the banking side as well to go to go with it. That's the thing, and I think that's the key. It's become such an, I've done a lot of research on this over the last year, because it's, been, it's become such a moot point now among pretty much everybody that this particular infrastructure where you have automated, you have tier one banks, you have the EFX division of each tier one bank, mostly coming from London, aggregate, sending an aggregated price feed down to a prime of prime. And the prime of prime is then selling that price feed as such to retail brokerages. Now that's great, and everybody understands this now, even yeah. retail customers to a large extent do, which is great. However, five years ago, it was quite possible to maintain an existing prime relationship if you were the, the prime brokerage in the middle, the non-bank prime that's actually providing liquidity to the brokerages with a five million balance sheet. Nowadays, it's 50 to 100 million, and in some cases, not at all, even if they have the capital, because they will assess the... For example, here in Switzerland, you have a Swiss banking license, like Swissquote, which is a publicly listed company on the Swiss Stock Exchange with a banking license. You have Ducas Copy, which is a, it's a smaller company, but it's a Swiss bank, IG Bank. You have um, Saxo Bank here in Switzerland. Very likely that any executive from any of those companies can go up to a, a, a tier one bank, even Citigroup, which is the biggest Forex dealer in the world, 16% of the whole market, which believes that through a written report they publish that the potential default rate of uh, um, OTC derivatives is 56%. So that set a precedent, everybody else followed suit, they all got nervous. All of these Swiss companies will be able to go up to them and they'll have no problem at all. Immediate uh, counterparty prime relationship with a tier one bank easily, regardless of size. However, that may not apply to even a large non-Swiss bank uh, retail brokerage anywhere else in the world. No, you're right. I mean, uh, I mean, th there is still, uh, you know, cons you know, 
challenges uh, even as a Swiss bank getting a prime brokerage relationship with Tier One Bank. More or less, they're 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 looking at the balance sheet. They're looking at the uh, you know uh, how we're regulated, what risk what risk controls we have in place, uh, not only for ourselves, but also for the clients. Yes. Um, so that, that it's not easy to get a prime brokerage relationship. You, you first, yeah, you have to have a big, a large balance sheet, uh, but you also have to have the, the whole mechanism in place uh, yeah. as far as monitoring and controls in place to get, yeah, to, get a, to get a good relationship with a prime broker. Yeah, so that's actually something where in which Swiss banks and certainly electronic trading companies, which happen to be Swiss banks, have perhaps some kind of an advantage in maintaining those particular relationships. I think it's, it's perhaps in these particular constrained times, ultra conservative times, that might be a, a good advantage, perhaps. So exactly. uh, that's great. Thank you very much for joining us, Ryan Nettles of Swiss Quote. Thank you, Andrew. Nice to see you. You too. I'm Andrew Saxe McLeod, Chief Executive Officer of Finance Feeds. Thank you for joining us here at Ducas Copy TV in Geneva, Switzerland. See you next time. Goodbye.